This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 809, recorded on September 24th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. It's 86 <laughs> degrees and sunny. It's a glorious day. We are entering fall. Everything's wonderful. Here it's 22 C. It's, uh, it's sunny. It's a nice day. Humidity's gone way down. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And the weather has improved dramatically. It was pouring rain this morning and now it's clearing up and 70 Fahrenheit, 21 C. And it's supposed to be a glorious weekend. Uh, also just getting into autumn, which is the best season here in New England. Also joining us from here in New York, Amy Rosenfeld. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Amy's in the Especially lab today, right? I'm in the lab. Well, everything. that's where you're every day. I shouldn't say that, right? For this I'm episode. Uh, Dixon yes. tried to join us. We spent 20 minutes trying to solve his technical problems. <laughs> Apparently insolvable. And so he's bowed out. And fortunately, that's what happens when you have a 50-year-old computer, not a five-year-old computer. So sorry about that, Dixon. It's too bad because both papers have to do with bats. Really cool. Two really cool papers. First one is uh, it's under review at Nature. And when they do that, they post the preprint. They call it Research Square. And in this one is called Coronaviruses with a SARS-CoV-2-like receptor binding domain allowing ACE2-mediated entry into human cells isolated from bats of Indo-Chinese Peninsula. Uh, this comes from a, a group at the Institut Pasteur, um, which I think they have a campus in Laos, right? I believe so, yeah. There's also Paris. I didn't realize that the Institut Pasteur has campuses all over the place. Yeah. So the the first author here is uh, Sarah Temem from the Institut Pasteur, and the last author is Mark El Eloi from the Institut Pasteur. We also have Sylvie Van der Werf, Felix Ray, who are two senior people that I know, and many authors in between, and a number of folks from the University of Lao. That's right. Well. That's right. So as everyone knows, the, we have. Uh, talked about various SARS-CoV-2 related viruses or viral genomes, I should say, recovered from rhinolophus <laughs> bat species uh, in China, in Thailand, in Japan. But the closest still remains in terms of percent identity at the genome level, remains RATG13, isolated in 2013 uh, in China. Um, Described in 2013. Described, it's never yes. Been never isolated. Never isolated. Never been isolated. We don't have any virus. That's just a genome sequence. But it's no longer considered, after you read this paper, it's no longer considered the closest. Well, I don't no. know. On the tree, it's still pretty close. It's not the closest. All right, pretty well, close is not the closest. Maybe you'll find it. this paper. I think, I, think, I think we're about to hear about some that are closer. Okay. Yeah. So SARS-CoV-2, as we've discussed, is a recombinant where apparently different viruses have contributed to its backbone. And uh, one, of, one of the important parts is the spike gene, of course, uh, which is responsible for binding to uh, ACE2 in the receptor binding domain in particular. That of RATG13 is very distant from that of SARS-CoV-2. Only 11 out of 17 contact amino acids so the contact between spike and ACE2, there's 17 that we know of. Only 11 of those 17 are identical between RTG13 spike and SARS-CoV-2. So um, nothing and this, else. This recombination process is not only common amongst coronaviruses; we see it with SARS-1 as well. Yeah. So they say in this paper, we need to among all viruses. Well, among all viruses, but they're, they, the whole spillover from a recombinant thing is a story that. I'm just saying, we saw before 20 years ago. With Corona 1, SARS-CoV-2 1, SARS-CoV-1. Yeah, we... the, um, so the a key point they mentioned is we need to find viruses with a better, with a more similar uh, RBD and spikes. So in this study, they go to the limestone karstic 
terrain in Laos, which is common. They say to the, to China, Laos, and Vietnam, these are caves made of limestone. And I'm sorry, Dixon isn't here. He could talk about karstic caves, um, but he's not. So I, we won't. Florida of, is full of them. Is that right? Yes. They have the freshwater springs in Florida that are all over huge parts of the state flow through uh, limestone yeah, karst. Cool. Which is and they have now. crazy ass cave divers. They have completely insane people who go and dive and and explore okay. hundreds of meters. You can go into in you can caves. enter one spring and swim to another. Wow! If you're if lucky, you're, I wouldn't. If do you're that. insane enough to do that, I wouldn't and do you that. survive. You yeah. get stuck and you run out of air. One of the first it. things you learn scuba diving is never to go someplace where the overhead is blocked. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Um, so these are underwater, so there are no bats there, obviously. No, no, not anymore. But these uh, caves in uh, China, Laos, Vietnam, they're all very similar uh, ecosystem of bats. So they uh, decided, I wanna, yeah. I want to point out before we get too far into this, that this is exactly the kind of work that needs to be done yep. to discover where this thing came from. Yes. Rather than... All of the rumor and innuendo and political flap and everything else having to do with the, what in my opinion is a distraction of the lab leak theory. These are, this is the kind of work that needs to be done. And this paper will show uh, how it can be productive. Yeah. And one other thing, since we've already gotten past it in the introduction, there was one sentence in the introduction that really jumped out at me that I loved says, since its appearance in humans, SARS-CoV-2 has, uh, has evolved only through sporadic mutations, some of which correspond to gains in fitness, allowing the virus to spread more widely or to escape neutralizing antibodies. Yes. yes. We've had so many discussions about whether it's more transmissible, blah, 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 blah. And... This uses one of our favorite words, fitness. It uses another favorite word, spread. Yeah. Okay. Is broadly inclusive in terms of mechanisms. And I think really describes, that sentence really describes the evolution of these viruses very nicely. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I like the use of fitness. Congratulations to the authors for doing that. And we've seen studies, we've talked about studies like this before. Let's go look at bats. Right, because sure. that's where you're going to sure. find the origin of this of this pandemic, um, and they are, you know, where do, where do you look at bats for this type of study? Well, you want to be China, southern China, Southeast Asia generally, and this is exactly what they're doing. They're do, doing the exact right study. Well, you don't have to be in that geographical location. That's probably where you. No, you could you could look at bats anywhere. Well, but, I mean, these bats happen to be from. Japan all the way down. Yes. And they also are found in Eastern Europe. So in the caves in Transylvania and sure. southern parts of Russia. And so we've had multiple discussions, Vincent and I, about this. And um, Vincent will attest that every time he talked to me about it, I said, you're looking in the wrong spot. <laughs> China, you're looking you in the China. wrong spot. Yeah, You said look south, right? I said, you have to look south for whatever reason. You have to look south. I was like, it's not where you think it is. Oh, here you go. They look south. Else. They look south. Yeah, well, yeah. And Were you talking you know, to them? Yes. I called them up on my iPhone <laughs> in my shoe and I said, here's where you need to look. <laughs> That's a conversation from an older twiv. It's a reference. Yes. No, it's true. Um, it looks out. But that, well, let's go through the paper. But I agree. South is where to look. Uh, because well, for this, for this, it happened to be right. But, but you could next look. time it might be from someplace else. But the thing is, is that the whole other idea is just centrally focused on where you we diagnosed a significant number of the initial yeah, cases. Sure. Right. And if Agreed. we had kept that philosophy for HIV, we'd still be looking in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's right. Yes. That's right. Good luck to you. Yeah. Um, so they have uh, they sampled 645 bats this is in the northern part of laos which uh these bats are from six families 
46 different species, 247 blood samples, 608 saliva, 539 fecal swabs or, or samples, and 157 urine swabs. It's a lot. Yeah. They did some amplification first uh, by PCR, pan-coronavirus uh, nested PCR, and they found from 24 bats uh, of 10 species, um, a number of viruses, and, and they are both... Uh, Sarbeco virus, alpha coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses. And then they did some uh, full genome sequencing. They did five, uh, so they had seven Sarbeco viruses, which were from the Rhinolophus species. Uh, and they um, found these in three different districts of Laos. So they got the, th the complete genome sequence of five of these seven Sarbeco viruses. Uh, and then um, they have several that we're going to refer to as, as banal, B-A-N-A-L. I guess B for anal swab or something like that, but it ends bad, up being bad anal swab. Anal. Yeah, the anal banal, swab. right? Banal is... Right, banal. These are, these are not boring viruses, but they call them banal. <laughs> they call them banal. Um, so, um, so they have banal 52, 103, and 236 are quite close to SARS-CoV-2 and, and RATG-13. Um, 116 and 247 are from what they call a sister clade that are actually related to other viruses, SARS-CoV-2-like viruses that we've talked about, like RMY, NO2, et cetera, but they're more distant. Um, and the key they hear that's already evident, they're coming from different species, uh, right? They're not just all from the same kind of uh, bat, but these but species they all, all- live in the same cave. Yeah, they live cave. in the same cave. They, they, they live, share their, yeah. Sympatrically, what is what does that mean, Alan? Sympatrically in the same area, together. together. Yeah, they're <laughs> they're in the same in the same. They're in the same cave area. They're in the same cave in this case. So, um, they they do a number of phylogenetic analyses showing the the high level of nucleotide conservation, um, higher than RATG thirteen in the in the spike, and particularly the S one domain and the receptor binding domain. Yeah, and uh, I think. Um, uh, the overall nuclear or amino acid similarity or identity mm -hmm. uh, between these and the original and SARS-CoV-2, if I understand it correctly, is not higher than RATG13. But that's not necessarily relevant. Right. right. It's uh, it's the it's the the spike in particular that's is right. closer, um, and as we'll see, you know that. Uh, all all makes sense. Uh, my point is, um, uh, it's not so much the overall uh, similarity that's important. It's kind of where that is. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Plus similar, the fact how that similar plus are the, the important parts. Yeah. Plus the fact that a theme here is that they're not proposing necessarily that this is a precursor. They're going to get to the point that what this means is that these bits are out there. And there's a lot of recombination going on, okay? So there is the potential for some of these bits to recombine with yeah. some other bits and cause a spillover. And this is well, so much like the SARS-1 story. Yeah. Well, it you is eventually, the SARS-1 story. The yeah, well, SARS-1 story, you, you get to the right cave and you find all the bits. Yeah, we got all the bits. We didn't actually have right. a virus that's the proximal ancestor, but we had the bits for SARS-1. Yeah, right. right. yeah. But they say at the end of the paper, that, or in the middle of the paper, that SARS-CoV-2 is five is the generation of five recombination events. That's right. In fact, and they here, say that one of them most likely came from the acquirement of the S1 domain probably came from these. Yes. Yeah. And then somewhere along the line, most likely in the jump from humans to from bats to humans or whatever. Um it acquired the furin site. That's it's right. It's not something that they needed. And they, I mean, this kind of is the paper that says, whoever thought you always had to have an intermediate host from bats to humans, you're totally wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's clear. Um, and no, which is, no pangolins were harmed in the, in the conducting of this. Well, the pangolin They talk maybe, about that link a little Yeah, bit. I was going to say, and they talk about like how far away it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, the next thing they do in this paper is a recombination analysis. And they say five, as Amy said, five sequences have contributed to this, and that's RMYNO2, or RPYNO6, RATG13, Benal52, and 103 from this study. It's quite clear that they contributed 
uh, parts of the, the genome to SARS-CoV-2 and no pangolin sequence is, is associated right. with a recombination event. You know, we should it, just make clear that out of the 17 binding residues, 16 are present yeah, in these We're getting to it. We're getting to it. Yes. I mean, it's not even, you know, wishy-washy. Yeah, among the 17 contact residues of RBD with spike, 16 are conserved between COVID-2 and Benal, 52 and 103, and 15 of 17 are conserved for 236. And remember, um, the Cambodian isolate, 13 of 17 are, con are conserved, and RATG 13, as we said, 11 of 17. So uh, these are much closer in the RBD for sure. And as, as uh, Amy mentioned, there's no furin cleavage site uh, in any of these. So they, well, they, there do, I mean, there doesn't really need to be. Well, I don't there know. doesn't need to be. Yeah, well, the no, furin so. seems to be important for human um, transmission. Right, That's but right. it's not important at all for the bat. No, right. apparently not. Um, so we folk, we spent a lot of time focusing on something that may, at the end of the day, not even be important in understanding the spillover event. Right. And as, as they say, it may, well, we're going to talk about the ACE2 binding in a moment, but these, this is the kind of setup you could get for a virus that could spill into humans and subsequently develop a furin. That's right. Well, yeah, that's, that's right. what I'm, that's what yeah. I said before is that the yeah. human, they, the, at the end, they say that, you know, uh, it's neutralized by human anosera. Mm -hmm. It binds ACE with, with very high um, affinity, like almost yeah. equal or above what SARS-CoV-2 spike does. And that the acquisition, we've, we've basically wasted a ton of time focused on the furin site. And that might have been something that was acquired after it jumped into humans to make it more transmissible in humans. Right. We didn't know it. We, we shouldn't focus on it. We only lo know in hindsight, right? So it's, it's fine. So yeah, I was thinking about that as I was reading this paper is that the uh, evolution and thinking over time yeah. uh, has been amazing, you know, because, uh, you know, there was a lot of focus on our ATG 13 and then the pangolin thing came up and everybody said, oh, that's it, that's it, it's the intermediate host. And, yeah. you know, no, it's not that simple. It takes a lot of this sort of digging around to piece this whole thing together. Yeah, but the pangolin host lasted about 15 seconds. And then I went back to our <laughs> People still say pangolins, you know. Even though the people who, who follow the science carefully know, there are many others out there who think it's still pangolins. Yeah, I it can, is very hard to undo something like that once yeah. it gets into the headlines. Right, but, it, but, but, science, but most people... I mean, I'm here almost every time we discuss this because generally these are the papers that I find and are like, oh, this is really like, we need to talk about this. This is very cool. Um, but the pangolin and then, you know, we quickly forgot or it wasn't even mentioned the other ones, the N whatever, 5 whatever it is. The ones from Japan or Thailand or something or other. Oh, the yeah. N, the RAM, the N, the RM, Y, N, O, yeah, that's in here. That's one of the ones that contributes to the recombination of this. Yeah, uh, I know, those, but yeah. I'm just saying that the public or the media oh, yeah. and most scientists have bypassed. They those. need to simplify naming these strains. Maybe uh, they're called you know, alpha and beta or something. You know, they, well, so they're all come. The R. No, no, no. Yeah, quite, I mean, I, I think I, they're I, pretty. I know where the, the R is rhinolophus, me, the species name, RM, rhinolophus, yeah. malaysia, right. or whatever I was going to yeah. say, to me, it seems very simple. It, is. it tells it you what the silly. bad is. Yes. All right. So yeah. then the, the, what I think this paper is nice is because then they do some experiments. Um, they make the spike protein um, and they do affinity binding using uh, Biacore, um, and they, which, which is a very nice instrument for doing... Um, affinity studies between proteins. And they find that the uh, R receptor binding domains of 236, 52, 103 have an affinity for ACE2 in the low nanomolar range, which is really low and good. It means it's tight binding with values comparable to those reported for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so this is terrific. And that's certainly not the case for the RBD of RATG13, we've talked about that before, how it has very low yeah. affinity for ACE2. They made homology models of the complexes of spike with ACE2, and they can see uh, the interacting residues, very similar in 
Benal's and and uh, ACE2 compared to SARS-CoV-2. There's some differences, but it looks like they're binding very well by those models. Yeah, I think it's a salt bridge. And they, uh, they, um, they actually also determine the crystal structure of the complex of Benal-236 RBD with ACE2, part of ACE2 to 2.9 angstroms resolution. I guess that's Felix Ray's contribution here. I've just got to comment that, <laughs> you know, having come up through science when, in, in graduate school when I did, and now reading a paper and just like as an incidental mention in the how to do things. Uh, oh, so we solved the crystal structure of this. Like, wow. Yeah. That's... <laughs> no, it's great. Yeah, but I mean, it's, great. it's like yeah. any. No, but it's I, like I realize now else. it's become it's become. But a it's like any. Game. I was going to say it's like anything else, right? Yeah. You, we learned. Vincent when Southern how, first did his blot, it was a big deal. Yes. Right. Now we and don't now, do them anymore. <laughs> yeah, now we don't do for even. What, what are you that, talking yeah. about? We do them all the time. <laughs> um, Southern blots all the time. No. Rod does upstairs. Of course he does. Really. <laughs> for well, sure. Good for him. <laughs> and Lorraine do, and other people I know do Northerns. Shankar's that, lab does right. Northerns. Okay. No, Northerns I and, can see. Um, but I mean, once you have the parameters yeah. for a related protein, you just plug you just and chug it. that protein yeah. into it, which is why when they did the cryo-EM structure of this, they already knew what the parameters were for the cryo-EM of sure. other spikes. So it was like, okay, fine. That's what you did. It was no, like, no, no. oh understand. my God, you solved something incredible. Well, I, understand, I understand mechanistically why it's straightforward. It just still always hits me when somebody does that in a paper, like, okay, so here's the crystal structures. Oh, wow. They I just, still they think just it's throw good. these things away now. I think know? it's still good. I think it's we shouldn't minimize anything that you do yeah. because the results are informing. In fact, in this case- well, then. We, then you should, then you'd have to revamp your whole thinking about people who make infectious clones. Um, the crystal structure of Benal-236 RBD and ACE at 2.9 angstroms is identical to that of SARS-CoV-2 RBD and ACE2. It's really remarkable. Um, and most of the interactions are there except for one minor one. So these are very close despite one or two amino acid differences. And I think Amy already mentioned that the human anti SARS CoV 2 antibodies neutralize this binding. Yeah. Uh, that's the next experiment, right? They make a pseudotype, a lentiviral pseudotype yeah. with the, either the Wuhan or the Benal 236 spikes. And uh, these can infect and enter 293 cells, human cells, producing ACE, ACE2. And that's blocked by, um, oh my gosh, look at that. Look who's here. Dixon? I was hacked. My uh, computer was hacked. Oh, no. You Welcome, Dixon. Right Welcome, Dixon. We're just talking <laughs> thank, thank about uh, the first paper. Thank you. So thank the, you, the entry you. of these pseudotypes into cells is blocked by sera from uh, people that have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. So that's cool. And now the one thing I would have liked to see is the same experiment with RATG13 spike. I don't mm. think it mediates entry or if it does, it's oh, it doesn't. extremely inefficient. It doesn't. It's been shown it doesn't. Zero? Zero entry? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. I think it's very so why low. Would I, I don't know why I would want that one versus the RMNO502Y. I would think that was more interesting. Yeah, that's closer. RTG. I think so. Yeah, it would be so a, RTG13 would be is... I don't uh, really care about I it. I think... Um, a couple, maybe this has all been done. That's why they didn't do it. But I think it's very yeah. impressive that the banal spikes can mediate entry. Um, and then- Well, I think it's critical. It's important. Yeah. Then the it's the most important finding we have to date about where the virus came from. That they can, that they can mediate entry, that the entry that they mediate is by ACE2 and that it's blocked by human- Right, and it is so similar. All of that together is just like- it's right. going it's in the so, same way with right. the same protein. It's so similar. This is, you, it, it's like, if you were half a nail in the coffin, you're now 99.9% .9 of that is in the coffin. But it doesn't so mean that- a smoking that, bat? You call that a smoking bat? <laughs> yes, this, this, it's, it's almost this, it's a smoking bat. It's bat. pretty close to the smoking bat. Yeah. yeah. Well, right. this is, doesn't mean a that- smoking bat is bad for your health. It doesn't mean that this cave was the source, but similar caves no. elsewhere could have contained similar viruses, right? The point is yeah. that they're out there, they're very close, and you need no adaptation to humans cool. in the RBD to yeah, get cool. efficient right. and infection. The other, and, but it doesn't say that this cave is not the source. Oh, no, of course so, not. So it's much easier. So it's like 
are you innocent or are you guilty? <laughs> it's much easier to prove you're guilty. If you have to prove you're innocent, everybody's in jail. Right. So the, the last thing they do, which is spectacular, is that they isolate infectious virus from one of these rect bat swabs from, from the rectal swab from a bat. Uh, they put it on, they use Vero cells, uh, vervet uh, monkey kidney cells, and they see CPE, they do a plaque assay. <laughs> 3,800 oh. PFU per mil on that first culture supernate, and then they passage it and they get it up to 2.6 times 10 to the 6 PFU per mil. They have small plaques. They sequence the virus. It's, it's the same as the uh, original genome, so no changes have occurred in, at least at the in this uh, average sequence. So now they have a virus that they can do experiments with. It's not um, an average sequence. They did next generation sequence. They do that, but then they take all the reads and they make an average from them. Okay, they make a consensus sequence from it. Um, I think that this will be removed from the published manuscript. I hope it's not, but I bet it could be because the reviewers will say, well, you didn't do anything with it, but I think it would be wrong because now we have an isolate from one of these. Oh, no, viruses. I think this is absolutely, I think this is, this why is would critical. It be removed? Yeah. Yeah. Why would it be removed? Because the reviewers would, say, why would the reviewers say you didn't do anything with it? This is the I'm, critical experiment that you it's have. It's not a critical infectious. experiment to this paper. It shows you that you can recover infectious virus, but they haven't done an experiment with it. I agree it should be published. I'm just saying, I, I hope it's not removed. That's hope I think the recovery of the infectious virus is the experiment. You yeah, so? exactly. I think yeah, that shows, for sure. that shows you, you've you got a real virus that you can culture and here it is and it, and yeah, it reads true. Sure. And it, I, I feel that it's an important experiment. I'm just saying, I hope the reviewers don't review remove it, uh, which is possible. They may argue it doesn't mean anything. I agree that it means a lot but they could take it out and I hope not because this is the only SARS-CoV-2 like infectious virus that we have, right? Yeah, and I'm I am that's a really important I'm finding. amazed that it worked and nobody else can get this to work. It's great. It's really One good. of the things that uh, I think about as I read a paper like this and, you know, many other related papers is that if conspiracy-minded people uh, <laughs> look through something like this, they can churn this up into a horror story okay mm. oh these scientists are culturing uh you know sars like viruses out of bats you know look this can be done they're going to spread it all over the world and stuff uh you know i see it again and again people making horror stories of course actually one of you one of your little links in here is the yep. same sort of thing yeah. people making horror stories out of perfectly legitimate science That's damned right. if you do damned if you don't because right. if you right. don't do these experiments then there's no natural source for the virus and if you right. do these experiments then you are working with dangerous viruses in the lab exactly yeah so they say uh, RATG13 is no longer considered the proximal ancestor uh, we have at least bits of the proximal ancestor here um, uh, the fear, as we've talked about the fear and cleavage site that was probably acquired as it passed, uh, early on in humans, or maybe in some other animal, who knows? We don't know that. Um, they make an interesting, uh, comment about, uh, the ORF8. They, they mentioned that, uh, you know, ORF8 deletions, ORF8 is one of the open reading frames in the viral genome. Uh, ORF8 deletions were observed in a number of isolates, uh, from March, 2020, very similar to deletions that occurred in SARS in 2003. And they, they make the statement that ORFATE can be a marker of SARS-CoV-2 adaptation to humans. And uh, so ORFATE is present in the bat isolates. It can be lost in humans. Uh, and they say the, the presence of ORFATE in bats is consistent with bats being a natural reservoir of early uh, strains of SARS-CoV-2, early yeah. isolates. I think that's very interesting. And these ORFATEs are much more similar. To or uh, to mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2 than anything else than RTGs or the other or RTGs yeah. and and pangolins. So the initial statement that the only thing in this virus that was similar to the to to SARS-CoV-2 was the RBD was incorrect. The overall amino acid identity, uh, sorry, nucleotide identity, 
if you look at the phylogenetic tree, it's RATG13, but the whole genome is still closer to SARS-CoV-2 on the tree, but they're right next to these new isolates. That's what I was referring to. Yeah. One of the things that uh, impresses me time and again about these uh, sorts of comparisons there uh, in figure one of this, the last bit, they have one of these similarity comparisons with, I think they've got like 15 different viruses mm -hmm. where they've lined up their genomes and plotted uh, a similarity score. And uh, I guess it should be no surprise, but I'm always impressed uh, by the huge dip around spike okay there's a tremendous amount of pressure on spike yeah uh, i guess on an evolutionary scale at least that's the way i interpret this um uh indicating that it, it really is a major factor in uh how these viruses mm, change from from one another and it and and you know i mean it's obvious that i guess that it's a major factor in uh uh, host range, okay, uh, and that that's what's going on. It's not the only factor. This we've 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 emphasized many times before, but it is a major barrier. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. But as you said at the beginning of this podcast, um, that that we didn't really care about the rest of the genome. We only cared about Spike. Certain people, yeah. So, well, ninety nine point nine percent of this 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 pandemic is a pandemic about spike. It's sure. not about yeah. anything else. Well, it'll be interesting to uh, ultimately, you know, maybe decades from now, figure out what other bits yeah, I agree. are important in yeah. the adaptation sure. and in the host range. Because that's, that, that's going to be ultimately as important in being able to assess potential for spillover. Well, right. Yeah. But I think like people have already started, like there's mm -hmm. ORF3 deletions sure. and point mutations. There's ORF7, I think. All of the ones that are the classic interferon antagonists have yeah. been yeah. altered to some degree. But that is about what? 0.3% of the literature yeah, and 0.3% of the interest and in everything else, everything else. As I said, it's a pandemic about spike. So I want to just mention one last comment, which is quite interesting. So they conclude we have new bat Sarbiaco viruses that have the same potential for infecting humans as early isolates of SARS-CoV-2. So they say people who work in caves, people who collect guano, uh, religious communities who spend time in caves, I didn't know that, tourists who visit caves, they have some risk for exposure and we should look at those populations to see if they're seropositive, whether they yeah. are protected against SARS-CoV-2 infection. And they make this interesting statement. So <laughs> if they were in caves and they were infected with a early version, one of these viruses, say, with no furin site, Maybe that's why they might not have developed disease because in animal models, when you remove the uh, furin cleavage site, uh, you have far reduced disease severity and then you're protected against subsequent uh, challenge. So it would be interesting to find people who were infected in caves who are seropositive. They, oh no, I never got sick. And they, they're they never get SARS-CoV-2 as a consequence. I hope we yeah. can find those those uh, yeah, people. Yeah, find, find them before before they're vaccinated. I mean, everybody should get vaccinated, but <clears throat> yeah. once they are, then they're going to have antibodies from that. That's true, yeah. But this also allows it to go, you know, people who, tourists who visit cave, these caves and stuff, you can imagine that you were, you know, you went on vacation. Like my sister went to these countries after she graduated law school. And they took a lot of different tours and they went all, you know, to the rainforest, they went to the caves, they went to the markets. And then six weeks later, she came back to New York, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how mm -hmm. this could, mm -hmm. it, okay, so it's centralized in Wuhan, but it doesn't really mean it came from there at no. all. It doesn't even mean it came from right. China. Right. Right. Like, and and <clears throat> just in terms of the geography of this, I mean, these, this study and some of the others we've talked about <clears throat> are in Southeast Asia, and you've got Laos is the only landlocked country in there. There's Vietnam right next to it, and um, yeah. and China 
right up. In fact, where these are caves in northern Laos, yeah, which yeah. is up near the Chinese border. Um, the bats don't recognize borders. So, of course, you're going to have the same bats transiting across this whole area. Well, even if they don't transit across, like when we did the got, NEPA paper, that, you right. know, they 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 move six miles and then somebody, another, they roost with another they unit with and another they bat. unit... And that unit moves six miles and they roost right. with another unit. And maybe that other unit is also potentially another species. And then lo and behold, you have NEPA in uh, the town that Dixon was in, in India. That's not part of the NEPA belt. Right. Kerala. Is, Kerala, both, Kerala the, yeah. both the bats Kerala. and the humans yeah. move. Yeah. And well, so yeah, you, that's can, why you can easily see these pieces of virus transiting across borders sure. in either the bats or the humans. And as you said, Amy, somebody goes on a tour or somebody's a guano collector, um, travels somewhere, um, and then it shows up in a totally different city. And and you're absolutely right. You know, the first place it shows up is not going to be where it's from necessarily. Right, exactly. Right. I mean, that was right. my, that's my point about HIV. I mean, yeah. it really, it was here in New York. It was in the Dominican Republic, but it really exploded in LA and it's associated, the outbreaks are associated, the first outbreaks in the U.S. are associated with L.A. So if right. you took all of these people, they all know who we're talking about, who come out with the conspiracy theories and the lab leak hypothesis and say, well, it's because the Wuhan Institute, blah, blah, blah. We'd still be looking in South Los Angeles or yeah. Orange County or, or Beverly Hills. Yeah. Well, fortunately, the people who or do the Santa science, Barbara. people yeah. who do the science, don't subscribe to those notions. And so they, well, they some look of them the right do, place. right? They sign, yeah. some yeah. of them do considering yeah. the fact that they signed Bloom's letter. Right? Yeah. Alan, are you saying that bats do not need vaccination passports? No, <laughs> no. Somebody ought to vaccinate those bats. Oh, that's though. a good well, idea. Well, that would be the next paper. <laughs> yes, it would oh, be. <laughs> it would be. Um, it would and be. there's our segue. It's, yeah, so I this paper is another uh, paper that I like was very excited about, but took a year to convince Vincent that it was interesting. So this, the first paper Amy showed to me earlier last week, and I really hemmed and hawed until I read it. And then I said, okay, this is really cool. And then um, Amy gave me this one a year ago and I just couldn't get excited about it. But for some reason yesterday, I, I read it and I got very excited about it. Maybe because I just finished the other bat paper. I don't know. But uh, this is from uh, Nature Communications, Epidemiology and Biology of a Herpes Virus and Rabies Endemic Vampire Bat Populations. I mean, who Now, does Vincent, I don't know why you weren't excited about this paper. You've got herpes and vampires and bats in the Maybe in the it was herpes. Headline. I don't know. Maybe it was the herpes <laughs> virus. Dixon? What about- Are you excited? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I've even been to Transylvania, where the home of Dracula was supposed yeah. to be. And, uh, but this is Peru. Weren't yeah, I you know. In Marlene the vampire bats Peru? are mostly South American bats. That's true. They are. But weren't you in Marlene in Peru recently? Yeah, we were in Peru. We were in Peru, too. I was going to mention also in the other paper, my wife and I took a boat trip uh, oared by a, uh, a, a diminutive uh, Vietnamese woman to a cave, a very large cave, the bottom of which held one of the largest Buddha statues in Asia. Mm. Ah. And it's a Mecca for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. So you can multiply whatever you just said That's by what they millions. were saying. That's what they were saying. Was it a limestone cave, Dixon? Do you remember? Uh, most caves are limestone. Yes, that's wow. right. And this was a limestone cave. See, this there's, was limestone. there's a tidbit I wouldn't have known. Most caves There's are. a religious a religious uh, ceremony or group. Okay, yeah. so yeah. I've yeah. been, yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. been yeah. there's some cave upstate New York, a famous big- How Caverns. How Caverns. Are those limestone? Oh, uh, yeah. All of the lime, all of the caverns are limestone. Mostly ninety nine percent. So there are probably bats in that cave, right? Uh, yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Anyway, this one is so, Peru. So yeah. This, we have fruit bats, so fruit bats are usually in big caves. Yeah, but so this this cave that you went to is it like yes. with the Buddha? Is it like when you know people go to Mecca, they make that pilgrimage Something once like a year? That. To, uh, we weren't so that's exactly like sure. gazillions of people. Yeah, you exactly. no, it, it wasn't that many. It wasn't that many. But this but it gazillion, was, is that like 10 to the 7th or something? It is exactly right. 
<laughs> it's got a Google zero after it or something yes. like that. Oh, so I now I appreciate the, this idea that religious communities go to the, I didn't realize that at all. Oh, routinely. Oh. routinely. Yeah. I, I think it's I think it's almost a yearly or bi yearly pilgrimage. Yeah. And then, like and two have, times where you like bring the God like some sure. kind of So here's a scenario, right? You go to this present. you live this religious ceremony in the cave and then you go into town to a meat market. Yeah, that's right, yeah. that's right, that's and right. And then, that's then right. people think it begins in the meat market, but it actually started in, maybe this is an underappreciated potential origin, these caves. Very much that's so. my point. That yeah, was yeah. my point. Yeah, got it. Plus you have scientists that uh, specialize in caving and then you've got this, you know, uh, adventurers, spelunkers. Yep. And those are not trivial numbers. Those are, there's a lot of people that do that. So... You have all kinds of interesting groups uh, converging on a common problem. We have, uh, uh, there's a microbiologist, uh, Hazel Barton, who is a cave I microbiologist. We've had her on oh, TWIM. Wow. She goes into caves and collects, you know, water and dirt and just to see what microbes are in them because there's yeah. a unique, unique community there. And yeah. um, so I suppose she is also at risk for uh, Absolutely. being infected. Of course, Absolutely. she mainly, well, actually, she goes to other countries as well. Very interesting. I think we need to have yeah. more more sampling of caves just to see what's in them, not just these in, in South China oh, and yeah. Southeast Asia, yeah. right? Yeah, there's anyway. some fascinating caves. I mean, we, that's another subject, of course. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so this one, um, first author <laughs> is um, Megan Griffith's last author is Daniel Stryker. And this comes from... A number of groups, uh, the uh, University of Glasgow Center for Virus Research, which I've visited a number of times, uh, and um, Association for Conservation and Development of Natural Resources in Peru, Yuncas, Yuncawasi in Lima. I don't know what that is. Um, I don't either. And the Indiana University in Bloomington. Um, so here the issue is vampire bats in Peru. Um, transmit rabies virus to not just to people, but to livestock. And not and just Peru, but this is a pan South American problem, the vampire bats, I think. Yes, yeah, so across yeah. Latin America, that's right. Uh, mortality in livestock is estimated to cause losses over 30 million a year. And the number of vampire bat to human cases now surpasses the dog to human rabies. So, I thought that was really striking. Yeah. It's yes. more than dogs or wild carnivores. It's vampire bats to human transmission is is a bigger source. Of By the way, uh, yeah. So for the for the newbies here, rabies is uh, an enveloped RNA virus. Okay, that is transmitted to humans at least, and um, and uh, among other animals primarily through saliva, transmitted uh, by bites. Uh, and it's uh, fearsome in humans and many other a animals because it has uh, virtually, if not literally, a 100% mortality rate. Yeah. So uh, that is once you once you develop symptoms, uh, it the disease develops slowly enough so that if you know you've been bitten by a rabid uh, animal, you have an opportunity. And this is a this is a rare circumstance to actually do a post infection vaccination. Okay, to actually treat the disease because it, you know, it travels up your nerves, say, from the site of the bite to your brain. And it's not until it really infects your brain and you uh, start to uh, exhibit those sorts of symptoms that, uh, that, it's, that it's too late. Uh, but at any rate, <clears throat> it is nasty because of this. It's just yeah. uh, really, uh, really scary. And in uh, the hosts that transmit it to humans, vary by geography for various reasons. Uh, in places where, uh, in uh, uh, areas where there's uh, a lot of, where there's not good rabies control in dogs, dogs are the primary vector. Mm. Um, some, uh, some areas have a lot of stray dogs and that's the primary uh, reservoir. Uh, in places like in the U.S. where that has been, where the dog population is uh, much better controlled and dogs are uh, vaccinated, the uh, primary uh, vectors are wildlife of one sort or another. And we can talk about uh, how you deal with that. But in this particular case, um, uh, the vampire bats, are a uh, major vector. And I agree with Alan when I saw, you know, I thought, oh, can that be true? Because I'm used <laughs> to thinking about dogs uh, as the major vector, but holy cow, yeah. That's, 
bats. Yeah, and bats. one of the things with bats is they can, many species of bats can carry rabies and they don't seem particularly affected by it. It seems like right. it's a native virus to bats, which are probably the ancestral reservoir that then give it to the raccoon that bites somebody in the neighborhood yeah, yeah. or whatever. Um, and so in this case, you've got, you've skipped the middleman, you go straight from the bat to the human, and it's apparently a very efficient process. And as far as I know, I mean, I don't know of any other animal that um, uh, has a is reasonable uh, has a low mortality uh, rate uh, infected with uh, rabies virus. Mm. I was I was surprised that the bats are that resistant yeah. or have a low mortality rate. Yeah. Um, I was corresponding with somebody who was probably going to be listening to this uh, episode about. Uh, rabies uh, in Southeast Asia recently um, and pointed out that uh, dogs actually it's not 100% uh, mortality rate it's like hmm. only about 85% or something like that which surprised that. me or at least in some dogs so um, uh, he was looking at this as an opportunity to understand you know what resistance could be at any rate yeah. bats right. uh, are another excellent opportunity how come they don't die Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is, uh, seem to be resistant to a lot of viruses. Yep. Yes. Yes. This is true. So I one mean, of the, I'm sorry. Can I go just ahead. go ahead? Dixon. Just say one little thing, and that is yeah. that the African wild dog is threatened as an endangered species because of mm. domestic dogs in villages catching rabies and then running loose mm. and then biting a African wild dog, and it just it it, mm. it destroys an entire colony of royal mm. dogs as a result. So they were they were actually worried about losing the wild dog as a species in Africa because of that. Lots many, of many many countries with feral dogs. Uh, that's that's right. That's yeah. So India has 50, 60, 70,000 cases a year of dog transmitted rabies to humans as a consequence right. of uh, you can't. Right. It's hard to catch them and vaccinate them, right? So exactly. So this this particular issue, um, they say that vaccination is not really practical because subsistence farmers can't pay for it. They've tried poisons to cull the, the bat populations, but probably you can't cull enough bats to make an impact. So, And if you could, it would have bad effects on the whole yeah, ecosystem. That's sure. two good things. Um, how about vaccination? So we've talked a while ago about dropping um, vaccine-laced bait into the forests in Europe. And that has really contributed to control of um, yes. rabies That's in much right. of Europe, North America. And these are uh, these are typically, I think, Poxar's vectored vaccines. Uh, yep, right? it's uh, vaccinia virus, Copenhagen <laughs> strain being with, uh, interesting. with the, uh, with the uh, rabies virus uh, equivalent for those uh, coronavirus uh, listeners, the rabies equivalent of spike. Right, the surface protein that does that does attachment. It's uh, cloned into the box virus back, background, packaged into these baits, which are dropped out of airplanes. Mm. Right, uh, in uh, in the wild in uh, Europe and North America, and it's done a remarkable job. Yep. Okay, but it depends on uh, the creatures eating the baits. That's right. And you you vaccinate one creature, and that's it. Right. Okay. That's true. Um, and it has to be uh, done repeatedly and et cetera. This is a strategy that goes beyond that because I don't know how you're going to bait vampire bats. Okay. Yes. The, the so you need program, a, which I think has also been done in parts of the U S that's targeting wild carnivores. Um, yes. Like, like wolves and other dogs yeah. Yeah. and yeah. raccoons yes. potentially. And um, so, so land animals, um, bats, I mean, vampire bats, what are you going to do? Put a bag of blood and put Yeah, them? so the idea is really idea, hard to target. Them. <clears throat> the point is that the idea of a virus vectored rabies vaccine, it's a proven technology. Yes. But it's going to have to be done slightly differently. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in order to get the bats because their behavior is different. So the idea, right. the idea that they're proposing here is, and they, they don't actually produce this in the paper. They're just, it's a kind of a feasibility study and also kind of, a rationale for why you would want to look at these bats in this way. Um, could we have a spreading vac a vaccine vector? Yeah. So one that is transmitted subsequently. Mm -hmm. So you, you get it to one bat and it spreads it to other bats and vaccinates them by spreading the 
the vaccine vector. And of course, this terrifies regulatory authorities. <laughs> but we have we have an example in humans that accidentally works this way with the, the oral polio virus vaccine where you can get yeah. secondary vaccination of people. It's not really the main way you'd want to vaccinate the population, but um, but it can work. You can you can spread an attenuated virus and and get it. Um, but they point out here, I think right up in the in the intro, you don't want to just have an attenuated rabies virus that you try to spread to the bats because it could revert. Mm -hmm. We see this with the polio vaccine. It could revert and become pathogenic, and then all you've done is throw more rabies virus into the population. Yeah. Well, they you. point out that they, they 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 literally say we don't want to have it be polio vaccine because it reverts. Right. Yep. So that's why they pick something that has high transmissibility, low virulence, or right. pathogenicity, like a herpes virus, where it's just going to stay there forever. Right. What course, is it that's uh, all used to like to say? Love is fleeting. Well, unlike, like herpes is. No, here's the herpes phrase: is forever. Unlike, unlike herpes, herpes, is forever. herpes is forever. Unlike love, herpes is forever. Yes. And you also want it just to infect vampire bats, right? You don't want yes. it to infect everything else. So here, here. you need a virus specific or very specific to the vampire bat. Um, and herpes viruses are good candidates because they, uh, they cause lifelong latent infections or periodic reactivations. Maybe that could give you a boost, right? A natural boost <laughs> and so forth. Um, and they, a lot of them are, are not pathogenic in their hosts. So, and they tend to be super infectable. They're super mm -hmm. infectable, right? So, so if you've got if you've got a, a, a herpes virus, particular species of herpes virus, you can very likely be infected with another, you know, of the same species. That's right. And they have been studied as uh, potential vaccine vectors yes. in other circumstances. That's so right. The pieces are all right. Most of the pieces are there. So the paper is basically, let's go look for herpes viruses in bats for these reasons. Right. All right. Bat herpes would, viruses. Yes, would you expect the, the bat herpes virus to be sexually transmitted? Because if it is, then you're really, really zeroing in on bats and nothing else. Uh, herpes viruses get transmitted, depending on the herpes virus, by numerous different mechanisms. Sexual transmission is for some herpes viruses, but a lot of them are uh, oral transmission. And et cetera. So, and the one we're talking, the, the, the sort of what we're going to come up with here is a, a herpes virus uh, of a family that is uh, typically transmitted uh, orally. My saliva. So, yeah. the, the really? analogy here would be to something like um, um, what did they mention? They mentioned cytomegalovirus. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. Right. Spreads very easily. It's not sexual transmission. Like, what, 85% of North Americans have been exposed to it, have it, um, you know. Yeah. So the bat herpes viruses are, in, so obviously they're in bats because they, they've been seen. Uh, yeah. Not particularly in the vampire bat, D. rotundus, right? That's the Desmodus rotundus is the vampire. Yeah, the bat. D does not stand for Dracula or anything related. <laughs> um, and they say, well, let's look and see if, there are bat, widespread bat herpes viruses, and, and are they specific to D. rotundus? Uh, can we get evidence of superinfection? So that's what this is all about. And I think uh, the introduction is is wonderful. It's incredibly clear. They set forth their goals and how they're going to do it. Really nicely written. And then the data are uh, quite nice. So first, you know, what's the prevalence of this of a bat herpes virus in vampire bats in Peru? Uh, what's the uh, seroprevalence, which would suggest if it's high, that might be good that this virus could spread carrying a, a, a gene, for example. Um, you could do sequencing to see host specificity, look at different hosts, mm -hmm. see what it's infecting. And finally, see they use deep sequencing to look at super infection. Do we have evidence for more than one uh, isolate of, uh, of a bat herpes virus uh, in, in individuals? So that's what they do. They have a... Um, collection of, of bats, 21 bat species. And the key here is they co-roost with D. rotundus and also D. rotundus, 128 D. rotundus from 28 sites across Peru. They have a nice map there, kind of spread all they have, across. They have 111 the from, of individuals from these 21 other species that co-roost with them. And they have 128 D. rotundus. So they're looking very intensively in D. rotundus. And then they're also looking 
at a similar level of intensity with their with their roommates. Yeah, yeah the way I saw the way I saw this is, <laughs> uh, can you find it in a bunch of different bats, different types of bats in the same cave? Yeah, and if it uh, infects D rotundus, can you find it in a bunch of different caves? Mm -hmm. So That's they right. did both of those experiments. Yeah. Now they take samples from these bats. They do PCR, and um, they found bat herpes virus. Now they look for a specific gene, UL eighty nine. Uh, of the, the, the herpes viruses all number their genes, uh, the people who study them anyway, for the most part. So this is uh, UL89. And they find uh, nucleic acids in nine bat species, spanning all three families of new world bats that they looked at. Um, very high frequency in D. rotundus. 96.9% .9 of the vampire bat saliva samples were BHV positive. And all age classes of bats, they had a, they had adults, juveniles, subadults. <laughs> That's an interesting word, right? Subadults, adolescents, adolescents, um, and um, no, uh, it's randomly in all of them. No, no bias for one particular age uh, or another. And these bats were collected from 2015 to 2018. Uh, they have three bats sampled across those years. Three, all three of them were positive at all the time points. That's cool, right? Over a span of three years. Yeah. They also found the virus, the genome sequence in blood, 40% of blood samples. And this is interesting. At all 11 bats where they had paired samples, saliva and blood that were tested, were positive in saliva. And about half of them were also positive in blood. So they say this is probably a systemic infection. Um, and it's not contamination during feeding, right? Because you can imagine right. that a bat might eat something that- Well, especially virus. a vampire bat. And I think there's a discussion later in the paper <clears throat> about uh, um, some viruses that could be picked up just from hosts. Right. Right. So the vampire bat goes out, it feeds on blood, it comes back, you take a saliva sample, you get whatever's in that host in the saliva sample. Right. Because that's what it just ate. For our um, <clears throat> new listeners who came on board with uh, SARS-CoV-2, this may be the first time we've talked about uh, herpes viruses. And I want to uh, make the point that uh, viruses have different lifestyles. Okay. Uh, and, you know, talking about SARS-CoV-2, we're talking about a virus that undergoes what we call an acute infection where you get infected, you cook up a bunch of virus, your immune system uh, gets rid of it, and then you're done, at mm -hmm. least for the time being, because you're immune, you got no more virus. Not all viruses behave that way. Another lifestyle typified by the herpes viruses is that you get infected and then the virus genetic information hangs out with you for the rest of your life. OK, uh, sometimes in a quiescent stage, sometimes uh, reemerging. Classic example is cold sores and shingles. OK, people get uh, cold sores. They get cold sores repeatedly. And that's the same virus that they were initially infected with re-erupting now and then and causing disease. Everybody, virtually everybody has been infected with the virus that causes cold sores, but only a small percentage of the population actually manifests disease occasionally. And an even smaller smaller percentage of the population when they get old like uh, Dixon um, <laughs> and their immune systems start to crash. Okay. Did somebody mentioned uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and they uh, can't keep this thing at bay anymore. It will uh, reemerge uh, in, in a slightly different form and cause shingles. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the herpes viruses, that. including uh, this particular class of herpes viruses hang around forever. And I just want to make the point that that's, you know, very different than something right. like SARS-CoV-2. So do you consider this an unusual virus in bats because that's rabies, not the vi the herpes, but the rabies virus? It's it's in blood. They consider this a systemic infection in humans or any other animal species. It's neurotropic, zero, any, any other tissue that just stays in the nervous tissue. No, so so the, do the bats actually have this infection in their nervous tissue? So, and maybe that answers Rich's question as to why they don't get sick. Well, I don't know that rabies is not present in blood of humans. Yeah, right? it and, has and, to be. Uh, it has and I to also be. don't know the why? pathology in bats. The question is, is it present site... in the nerves in bats? Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's my question. Is it, right. it is this virus in the nerve of bats? That's correct. That's a good question. I don't know the answer. Yeah. 
And and relatedly, yeah. is rabies a chronic infection in bats, right. or is it just a continuously circulating? Well, bacteria? that's what we're going to actually look at next, <laughs> because they say the next issue is you want that, that your whatever vector you're going to use for your vaccine, it should transmit better than what you're trying to get rid of, yes. right? So they said we looked at active vampire bat rabies virus infection. Um, so they had these 128 individuals with saliva samples. They could test them uh, by PCR, and they found only 0.8 percent was were uh, positive for genomes. Vampire bat rabies virus, 0.8 percent. Uh, so uh, that's quite low, low prevalence. Yeah. Um, uh, of, among 99 of the individuals previously tested that had serum samples available, 12, that's 12% 12 had neutralizing antibodies against the bat rabies virus. Um, and they do see some variation in seroprevalence depending on uh, where they're looking, zero to 35%, but it's quite low, right? Um, and I, I like I highlighted these words because I, I, I was amused by them. They say, presumably reflecting the spatial metapopulation dynamics that underpin uh, bat rabies virus endemicity. <laughs> yeah, I had a little difficulty uh, at times with this yeah, paper. The vocabulary, yeah. <laughs> vocabulary was tough. But you know, the point is that if the, remember the, the, the herpes virus is in uh, 90 something percent of their samples, or at least genome positive. So it is higher than this. So they're happy right. about that. Right. And that implies that at least in these bats with this rabies virus, that the rabies virus is circulating on an ongoing basis in some small percentage of the bats. Yeah. Uh, so the question I have is, uh, you've got 21 species of vampire bats all in one place. Are each one host specific or are they, you know, omnivores? Do they feed on anything that will give them blood? I don't think all these were vampire bats, right? No, I think right. They were, so the, among the oh, vampire bats, they're I blood feeders, them. but they also I have these them. other species of bats that they're looking at. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I missed so that's the next question. What What's the host distribution of these herpes viruses? So do sympatric bats share the same uh, herpes viruses or do they have different... You, you would like it to be specific for the for the vampire bat, right? So um, they, they look at the nucleotide analysis, the sequence analysis that they've obtained from the different bat species... And they say you can see by the phylogenetic clustering distinct host species, uh, associated clades, um, quite clearly. Um, the uh, there's a very strong D rotundus clade of sequences uh, from vampire bats across Peru, and none of none of the uh, none of those sequences were found in other species. You can find bat herpes viruses and other species, but they, on the tree at least, they cluster separately from the uh, vampire bat species. Um, they also find an interesting observation. They have, the myotis bats have a, a clade that uh, is highly related to viruses <coughs> from Peru and Spain, which they say these are probably ancient uh, herpes viruses in these animals. Um, so one, there's one example of a possible cross-species infection. So they say the exception to viral cart compartmentalization by bat taxonomy, so this is just by the phylogenetic tree, was a sample taken from an Artibius litteratus bat. Uh, and that sample looked like the, um, the D, DR uh, virus. So they thought maybe there's a cross-species infection, or as they also mentioned, maybe it was just a contamination uh, right. and not really an infection in that other species. One uh, thing I was wondering about is whether vampire bats ever feed on other bats that they're co-roosting with. I don't know. Dixon, hmm. do you know? You well, mean, no, I don't know. I don't know. And... Um, the, the one thing I do remember about vampire bats, so I must say, I watched a video once on how vampire bats feed on cattle. If you ever want to get freaked out, mm. and this is the creepiest video I've, I think I've ever seen. Uh, the, the cow is asleep standing up. Most cows sleep standing up, or at least they sit down erect. They don't lay on their side, is what I'm saying. And the bat 
creeps up and you can see this little bat creeping up with its wings. You know, it's, it's got these little claws at the end and it's very, 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 very stealthy. If the, the skin of the cow twitches, the bat stops. Hmm. And then it waits to, for the cow to settle down, settle down, settle down. It gets up around the neck, and then it's got these very, 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 very sharp teeth. And it doesn't do a Count Dracula number. It doesn't hit the jugular vein. It just it makes a small incision, and they're so sharp that the cow doesn't feel it. And it starts to bleed. And as the blood oozes out of that slit, the bat licks the blood. Mm-hmm. It doesn't suck the blood. It licks the blood up, and it is the creepiest. <laughs> it's sinister. Oh, no, it's I'm absolutely totally sinister. <laughs> I, I've never forgotten that video. Yeah, I've seen you it. Know, I've seen it. I, I know it took you a long time to get around to doing this paper, but maybe we should have put it toward the end of October. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. <laughs> we can do it again. As a <laughs> I, I saw once in a zoo a vampire bat, and they had little tins really? of blood that they would go and lick. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I'm surprised that they didn't want it fresh from the, uh, from a mouse or something <laughs> like that. Uh, so part of, I want to uh, check myself on something here because part of what we've been talking about is what you'd really like if this herpes virus is going to be a good candidate is one that is very specific for these bats. So right. that if you go and use it for a vector, it doesn't go around and get a yes. bunch of bats that are not your target. And one of the things they did here was to compare the phylogenies of the vi- all the viruses mm-hmm. with the phylogenies of the animals. Yes. Okay. And uh, I can't really describe it in my own words, but uh, their conclusion, if I understood it correctly, was that those uh, compare Comparative phylogenetic analysis support the notion that these viruses actually evolved with their hosts. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And so that mm-hmm. that helps sort of lock down this yeah. notion yeah. that we have a very, very specific virus host relationship, yeah. which is interesting all by itself. Some mm-hmm. viruses, once again, a general principle, some viruses are more promiscuous. That's right. Some are more locked into a given host. And in this particular case, these right. viruses are very tightly tuned to a given host. And that's again, right. that's a that's a typical herpes virus thing. Yeah, you see this throughout animals and and even into you know many many non animal species. You see herpes viruses that have just co evolved for millions and millions of years with their hosts. Yeah, and actually, we're talking about this uh, difference in lifestyle. We're talking about here. Rabies is a uh, is a is an acute infection. It's also quite promiscuous. Okay, infects yep. a number of different vertebrates, whereas herpes is a latent infection and, and very specific. Mm-hmm. Herpes plays the long game. The last thing they do is to say, is there any, can we get any evidence for super infection? In other words, if a bat's infected, can another uh, of the same virus, the, the DR bat herpes virus, infect them? So they do deep sequence analysis of a few of their uh, PCR positive saliva samples. And they, find about 2% uh, of the nucleotides have single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, which are consistent with more than one virus infecting uh, those particular animals. Um, they say, we, since we have short reads, we really can't tell how many different isolates or strains, they call them, are infecting the animals, but they're clearly uh, more than one. So that's good. It suggests, as we mentioned earlier, if if you are releasing a vaccine vector, it will infect already infected uh, bats. I think this is a really interesting uh, study. Of course, what's missing is the virus. Yes. <laughs> so how would you get the virus, folks? What would you do? Well, you catch some bats. You would take bats and take a swab and put it on cells. You think, what kind of cells would you use? You'd need to use the bat that you're getting it from, right? Yeah. You may not have cell lines from those bats. Well, there's going to be plenty of virus around, right? Presumably, okay, Because a lot yeah. of these bats are infected, okay? You probably want to, you know, yeah, going to have to study the whole life cycle of this virus in these bats to figure out where to look. Yeah. I would, you do you want to know the pathogenesis of the virus uh, in the bats? It, it, given the that it's a, uh, a, a beta herpes virus, I think you're going to be looking at maybe, maybe, maybe uh, uh, blood cells, B cells, right? Mm, yeah. Isn't that where cytomegalovirus, cytomegalovirus hangs yeah. out? That's right. Uh, wait a minute. Lymphocytes. No, uh, no, no, no. 
It's not uh, B cells. I think it's T cells. I will look it up. But yeah, uh, it, uh, it's actually there's some some immune precursor cells, and uh, I think the myeloid the myeloid lineage is is uh, that that ancestor is infected. So, but the thing is. If you want to grow the virus, if you need a virus isolate, like they had in the previous paper, they got an isolate. They infected Vero cells. They were like, these coronaviruses grow in these, despite them being kidney cells. What could you do for this? So I guess you could try uh, common bat cell lines, but they might not work in in, in a non-vampire bat cell line, and maybe you don't want to Dude, grow it in it because you I, might buy it. Probably just throw them at everything at everything I could get. Yeah, I suppose. You'd have, to, um, you'd have to grow them at a higher temperature maybe? because the bat body temperature is higher than uh, most mammals. Maybe. Um, maybe. I mean, that would be a starting point would be bat cells yeah. at a bat body temperature. But yeah. Um, yeah. I think in this case, <clears throat> I would just take as many cell lines as I could, could get a hold of, um, try and culture it on anything. And then, of course, once you have it, I think you need a colony of vampire bats to do the experiments, in, right? <laughs> you do, yes. And then, you, of course, you'd need a volunteer to help feed them. <laughs> You're going to have to roll up your sleeves and get to work. Yeah. I knew someone who raised uh, 80s Egypti mosquitoes and yeah. used himself as the blood source. Yeah, yeah. But that, that would be carrying it a little bit too far to yes. love of your science so much that you'd feed well, your vampire bats. Well, but the vampire, the vampire bats. bats will apparently just drink out of a saucer, so that may be... This is all true. They could have a cup of tea with you. And get, stuff like get outdated that. <laughs> blood from the blood bank. And so uh, this, uh, here's, here's a 1996 uh, paper. It's just sort of uh, drawn out of the hat from a Google search, so I don't know... Whether this is the last word on this, I should know. It's been a long time. I'm retired. <laughs> uh, uh, cell targets. This is uh, HCMV. Uh, ubiquitously distributed cell types such as epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and fibroblasts are major targets. Leukocytes circulating in peripheral blood are susceptible to the virus. Specialized parenchymal cells such as smooth muscle cells in the GI tract and hepatocytes can also be infected. So uh, looks like a major targets are epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and fibroblasts. So obviously a lot of development has to be done yet before you, you're going to have. Yeah. You have to figure out where to put a gene. After you get the virus, where to put a gene, what gene. I suppose the rabies spike would be one. They mentioned that there's very little antigenic evolution that we know of, uh, so we don't have to worry about that. You'd have to test it in your, your bats. You'd have to make sure yeah. it doesn't infect other bats, right? And you do some eventually some limited field studies. Man, we're talking about a. Remember how long it took for Wolbachia release experiments to to get done. This is not trivial, this but is true. Uh, it could be a general approach. They actually mentioned it, it could be applied to any batch spe species uh, for which. Hey, this is interesting. For which reservoir targeted disease control is desirable to prevent zoonotic spillover. Now, let's see what other. Uh, what virus? are the zoonotic viruses <laughs> might want to prevent getting out of bats? You know what's interesting? I've always kind of <laughs> scoffed at suggestions to do something about the bats that harbor SARS-like coronaviruses, but this well, paper makes me less skeptical. Yep. You skeptical, have a vector. Yeah. You have a vector. Yeah. I mean, you could find rhinolophus-specific herpes viruses. And immunize and them. To, well, but you'd have to have some kind of a pan coronavirus vaccine against them because there are so many coronaviruses in the bats. Here, they're targeting just it's the true. just the rabies virus it's and true. just the rabies virus in in this yeah. that is found in this species. So, yeah, but we're only concerned about the sarbecos because those are the ones that seem to spill over. Where I mean, okay. yeah, uh, the alpha ones we have some. But you'd still you'd cold. still need a pan sarbecovirus. But there are people, vaccine. plenty of people who are making plans for work. Yes. Yeah. So I, this there week, are plenty of people making plans for universal flu vaccine too, and we don't have one yet. Yeah, so, but that's much harder because yeah. it, it changes. I know. It I'm just giving you a hard time. So the, no, I understand. Uh, interestingly, I'm just this week, that. this week, uh, a reporter for the Intercept talked to me, and sh they have. Uh, gotten grant applications from uh, EcoHealth Alliance mm -hmm. in the past couple of weeks for, by, by Freedom of Information Act. Uh, they got one a few weeks ago. Then they got another one, and she asked me to look at it. But one of the aims is to 
make a pox virus vectored spike coronavirus spike vaccine and oh my. go into caves and aerosolize it or something to infect the bats and vaccinate them. And wow. until I read this paper, I said, really? <laughs> but now, of course, no, that's not going to spread among the bats like this one will. Hey, no. hey, Rich, do you think bats have pox viruses? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know of a bat pox virus. I can't believe they're not out there. But of course, the herpes yeah. are, are more uh, suitable because they make these lifelong Yeah, absolutely. Infections. I mean, the, yeah. the lifelong infection and the transmissibility uh, is uh, is key to this whole thing. Yeah, As we said, the, the, the pox vectored vaccines in wildlife, are, it's, a, it's a one shot deal. You get one animal one time and yeah. you have to keep on doing it. Having this uh, transmissible yeah, is, is really cool. And as yeah, they point like, out in the you paper, you don't know this, if they have Picorna bat viruses. I mean, right. I think you know they do. nothing. I think that Ralph, uh, what was the fellow who worked in Barracks Lab who we had on TWIV? Uh, Eric, Eric Donaldson. Donaldson. He found oh, some yeah. Picornas in, in bats. Yeah. In, yeah in he Maryland. was the bat yeah. guy early on. Or, or Flavies or Togas or Alphas. I mean, go through the whole gamut. And, and it's possible, right, that some of these could establish persistent infections, right? In yeah. bats in particular. So, yeah, I mean, you, there's a lot to be done here. Um, so I, as, I, they, as they point out here, you don't necessarily have to have something that transmits super duper well. It yeah. just has to transmit better than whatever you're trying to vaccinate exactly. against. So in the case of the rabies virus, where only 0.8% of the bats have it at any given time, the, the R for that virus is very, very low in the bats. Yeah. And so you just need to beat that very, very low R value with your vector. And that's uh, potentially Find achievable a bat if you get past all these other. Find a bat rhinovirus. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Hey, by the way, how do bats transmit viruses to each other? Oh, they're sexually transmitted. So if oh, saliva. They're, they're next to it. They're very social. They're, they're on social. each other all the time. They're grooming. Yeah, they they're are true. always this pruning each other. Actually, they there was one bit right. in this paper talking about how, and this is, Right up there with Dixon's gross YouTube video. Oh, sure. uh, the bloods share food by regurgitating a regurgitating blood meal. the blood meal. Oh, I like and that. sharing it with their buddies. Yum. But we also like from Ian and Peter's paper where we did the with the best with the NEPA. I mean, they described the whole social and dynamic of Bats, the majority yeah. of bat colonies. Yeah. So, uh, 2013 novel pox virus in big brown bats, northwestern United States. <laughs> big brown. So bats. there's at least one example. I think this is a lovely paper. Thank you, Amy, for pointing yeah. it out one year ago. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was very cool. By the way, so the other aspect of this grant application, besides putting a pox virus vectored spike into bats, they want to deliver immune boosting agents into the bats. Oh, you know, to boost their, to, to induce interferon, for example, and try and clear, I don't know. I like the immunization better. Yeah. And that, that grant application, by the way, I think probably because they got it through a FOIA request yeah. and there's this yeah. perception that anything that was not already fully disclosed must be some kind of conspiracy. Oh, of course. And they blew it up. They blew it up into this story that I don't even know if we should link to that's, that's all no. about you know, how this supports the lab leak hypothesis. No, no, no it because it just get, it, it's just a negative spin on yeah. really exciting, really on, novel, on a creative. perfectly interesting, creative idea. Yeah, exactly. And which, by the know, way, was never funded. Yeah, it wasn't. Well, oh, yeah. yeah. But, now, it was so dangerous, even DARPA wouldn't fund it. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Right. Well, I don't know that I would use the word dangerous. No, it well, wasn't. But that the was conspiracy the theorists. theorists. Right, but yeah. uh, but coming from us, I wouldn't have chosen that word. I okay. would say it might be, they thought it might be risky in the fact that they wouldn't find anything, they wouldn't be successful. I mean, I get these crappy reviews all the time. Your experiments are too risky. There's no, there's no, we, we don't believe that there's herpes bat viruses. You, you know, don't have never... to come up with a reason why a grant wasn't funded, even by exactly. DARPA. They have a limited budget and they looked at this and they said, ah, you're never going to get this done. You know, it's, exactly. it's, it's an DARPA interesting idea. DARPA doesn't have idea, a budget, but Alan. I, I beg to differ with you. DARPA has no budget. <laughs> they go to Congress and they get the money they want and they right. never have a budget. Amy, so, the, the kind of risky comments you get are totally different. They're risky because they don't think they're going to work, Right, right. 
Right. But you know, they don't, I mean, you could imagine that somebody comes up and says, I'm going to vaccinate bat colonies with rate with bat herpes viruses where glyco D is now spike of coronavirus. And some, somebody is going to say, it's never going to be packaged. It's yeah. never going to be put sure, on the sure. surface of, of the virus. Yeah, that's the kind of risk so, that they're, yeah. yeah. So like, mm-hmm. yes, my grants get, tr- my early grants got trashed because they're like, oh, EV68 is not neurotropic. There's no reason for us to believe, but there's mm-hmm. thousands of kids walking around with EV68 and hundreds of them now have AFM from it. But, you know, I mean, that's no different really than this where they so say, don't, oh, don't forget don't forget the phrase, it's a fishing expedition. Yeah. Oh, I yes, I do like that one. You know what? I loved it because I, I know how to fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, great. It's a fishing expedition. Did you know which, did you know which fly to come? Which, I've but, caught many. <laughs> yes, but Dixon, which fly do you use? That's when you get those, When you get those, when you get those re- responses from the study section, which yeah, fly right. do you tie? It's embedded into the materials and methods section, which is very dense. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Small printed. Anyway, nice, see. nice if paper. If they ever find it, they'll get their hackles up. Nice yeah. paper. Exactly. Very, two very nice papers today of, yes. about bats. Common yes. Theme. Yes. All right. Yes. Let's yeah. do. Let's do some picks. Yeah. Oh, picks. Oh, good. Dixon, what do you have? Do you have more comedy okay. for us, Dixon? So here's what I'm doing. Because uh, <laughs> there's a method to what I'm doing. I decided to come up with a method, actually, based on my first two picks of the last two twivs. I, I've got a list of the top 10 comedians that I deeply respect and that I would uh, laugh at no matter how old the jokes and no matter uh, how dated the humor And so this is number three. I've got 10 all together. And I don't know if you want me to give them to you in a row or just disperse them among whatever's. But George Carlin talking about stuff. And it's not the old George Carlin. It's the young George Carlin. Yeah, this is remarkable. Uh, And he's so funny and yet so truthful. The reason why comedy works is because it's got a grain of truth in every uh, laugh. And it's a wonderful ad-libbed. The man was a genius. He could remember volumes of things and he never lost his lines and he uh, was always he he tried to remain even tempered but i think in, in his, as, he, as he aged he got very angry but i think his younger days he was absolutely a delight to watch and um all so this, comedy this, all comedy ultimately comes from anger uh, <laughs> probably, probably i saw i saw him um Back in the in the mid '90s, at the bottom yeah. line in New York, yeah. Yeah. Um, great show. But it, yeah, this is this is one of his all time classic routines. This is and up we, there, we've up there all with got the five this. Words you can't say on television. Yeah, well, no, I'm not going to go there. I, I picked right, a no, neutral this is, this topic is, on this. This one. is the stuff routine. That's and everybody's classic. got this problem. Look at your desks when you go to work, and you can easily see where that comes got from. Got all and, your stuff. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I I just picked it because this again, video this video has can, nine million views. Yeah. You can always use a good laugh. So By the way, said, just uh, in passing, yeah. Um, if you go to Google search and then type out the words vertical and farm, and I know we've had this discussion before, uh, guess how many hits you get on the, the last time I looked, it was 1.6 billion hits. Okay. And that means something. I don't know, Vincent, I don't know what it means exactly, but it means it, it's gaining in popularity. That's all I can well, tell if you, you. If you type in to Google search, if you type in Vincent. Yeah, let's see what you get. You get Vincent Price. You'll get Vincent. <laughs> you get, uh, oh, you get 662 million. So less than vertical farm. Okay. Hey. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, first, the first hit, by the way, is the song Vincent by Don McLean. That's interesting. Oh, interesting. Dixon, interesting. so you have now, George Carlin, you had, um, who, who did you I have? I started with Victor Borga. Victor Borga, Victor Borga. right. And who last? And then week? Ernie Kovacs was next. And this is George Carlin. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what no, next time no, I'm is, looking but it's forward. No, surprise us. Good. A surprise very us. funny guy. So it's you have very, 10. You have 10 in all? I picked 10, but I, could, I, can, I don't have to stop there. I can no, keep I bet going. Robin Williams <laughs> is one of them. No, no, he's not. Actually. He's not. No. Oh, I'm okay. surprised no. that it didn't start off with somebody from the Borscht Belt. 
<laughs> well, well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get because I mean, because we've got like, somebody in there. Like I was going to say, like I didn't do these alphabetically. I did them oh. according to my my likes. I mean, the first one, the Victor Borgo one, was just like I would watch this every guy, day just uh, to get a laugh. Rodney Dangerfield is that one of them? Oh yes, that's one. No, no, let's come on, don't give it away. Don't blow it. Don't blow it. Sorry. Even though I I don't think he's Jewish, I do think he I do think he came out of the Borscht Belt. Who, Rodney? Who? Yeah, Rodney yeah. Dangerfield. Well, no? He was more of a street fighter in New York, just like George Carlin. He grew up in Washington Heights, by the way. Huh? Yeah, but I thought he refined his routine in, in the bungalow. Yeah, like, a lot of comedians. No, did. a lot of yeah. them did. Um, yeah, well, we'll get to one of them. I have one of them picked out for okay. this, too. So we'll see. Dixon, you I know mean, your, your name on Zoom is 267724. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> uh, yes. I guess I'll commit that one to memory. I'm sure. Amy, what it's do you like have for same. us? So it's kind of like the same idea as Dixon. Oh, it's David just Sedaris, right? Yeah, it's like you know, it's based off of his everyday life, and he makes fun of he's like, his family. He's, he's he is absolutely. hilarious. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Is and so it's the same idea as as what Dixon's talking about for James Carlin, and um, this is just his com. I guess it's his. If I remember correctly, I read it a while ago because it's been out like a year. Um, it's like the highlights of his like previous thir 12 books and stuff. The, the best of me, it's called, right? Yeah, the <laughs> best of me. And, you know, I mean, it's just non-science because I've been writing a lot of grants and writing <laughs> papers. <laughs> Yeah, we know the feeling. We do know. Well, yeah, feeling. and I just, you know, I just finished a grant. I finished a grant update. I finished a grant pro final progress. I finished a paper. And now I'm writing another two grants. And you, you know. remember this when when you get so depressed over this. Just remember that no one ever forced you to do this. This is all you. <laughs> Dixon, really? is that You've supposed to make me this feel life? better? <laughs> is that supposed? To is that I'm not clear. No, what and I'm we've all to done do that. We've this, all we've all been down that road. We've all all of us has have lamented over the amount of time that we have spent producing something that no one else will read except 18 people. Maybe not even them. Maybe just but two. It's a, I don't look at it that way. I don't really oh. care how many people read it. I, 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 I spent the time because at the end of the day, I believe in the experiments and oh, of course, the pushing of the, yeah, and absolutely. pushing the science forward. And even if it's an incremental increase and it takes 50 years for somebody to understand yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. what that's I right. did, that's fine with me because it, it in 50 years, maybe it will make somebody's life better. That's fine. And I'll bet you that every grant you write, and I know it was true with me too, you learn something new that you didn't know before because you had to research an area which you had to expand into your background. Yeah, and for sure. That, I mean, that's, okay. that's the thrill of writing the grant. That's why I used to love writing. Yeah, I mean, every, that. like, the this last grant, um, I think we learned a lot with the grant that we wrote with Ian in July. Yeah, that was now. a good one. That was a good one, yeah. And I, I think right. we're we're learning a lot about um, this aspect of of science or biology for this other for this next one that we're also writing with Ian. Phil Sharp used to say, "The writing a grant lets you organize your right. thoughts." Right. He just died. Yeah, that's too bad. He did. No, he did. better not. Yes. I no, believe so. No. 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 no well, let's your, look it up. Oh, boy. Are we sure? Bill Sharp. Uh, Wikipedia is still using the present tense for him. Yeah, no, he's, he's still, an American. He's, he's yeah, still alive. He's still yeah. alive. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to spread bad rumors. He's uh, 77 years old. Who just passed, though? Some famous molecular biologist just, just passed. Well, let's Probably. see. What molecular uh, biologist died? <laughs> well, Jack, Jack Stevens died, died a while ago. No, uh, like I've in been, the last I've, two oh. weeks is the one that Dixon is talking about. Oh, you know that? Um, Jeff McKnight? Yeah. No, no, that was two years ago. Sorry. No, 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 no. No, it's, no, it's, it's in the Phil Times. Sharp. It's not Phil Sharp. It's, uh... it's in the Times. I saw it in the obituary yep. section. Yep, 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 yep. You don't know who, you don't remember? I I'm looking it up. Give me a few seconds. Move on to the next person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll get back to you. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I have a short uh, Ted sponsored video that my wife found about chimerism. Chimerism being uh, 
when uh, a single organism contains uh, cells that uh, are actually derived from two different organisms, okay, or at least genetically from two different organisms. Uh, and the uh, creator of this is, uh, I always look up the background, a woman named Kayla Mendel Sheets, who is a trained and certified genetic counselor who runs, uh, I guess, her own sort of private genetic counseling uh, uh enterprise and uh, does education along the way. Um, and so she uh, wrote this thing and it's, I don't actually like the animations, but it's very well done. <laughs> uh, and I'll just actually even give you the punchline. Uh, it is about um, a, a woman who had uh, like three sons and uh be, had genetic testing done for one reason or another. And uh, actually it was to look for a, a kidney donor uh, yeah. among her uh, offspring and discovered that uh, two of the sons actually hmm. had a genotype uh, indicating that their mother was not her, but her sister, okay, who never existed. Oh my goodness. Okay. And she was probably, uh, this woman was initially a twin, okay? And at some very early stage in the uh, embryogenesis, uh, some of the twin cells mixed with hers. So she is a chimera. Hmm. Um, and the, uh, uh, the twin otherwise did not survive. And apparently this is not uncommon, okay? So this is a great little video. Hmm. Neat. Do they ever survive? Twins? Um, no, the chimeric. The chimeric. Oh, the chimeric. So you'd have to, uh, yeah, two, two chimeric twins or a chimeric twin and a regular twin. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Interesting. So have a look. This is good. It's just quick. Four minutes. Cool. Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, a little project that I'm probably not going to get around <laughs> to, but um, uh, this guy, Ian Charnas, is a, a YouTuber who does little engineering projects. And um, he, he says he noticed that um, no one has ever made a nuclear-powered portable video game system. <laughs> I decided to fix that. Um, and he actually, he, he takes a, a Game Boy, a little portable tiny thing from about 20 years ago, um, and he develops a nuclear power rig for it. Um, he tries a couple of different things. He, he tries tritium, um, and he tries uh, uranium. Um, you can you can just buy uranium, by the way. And as he points out in the video, um, you, you buy these uranium rocks, just don't purify it, or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will put you on their naughty list. <laughs> Have you ever held a uh, monitor up to the urinal acetate in your laboratory? No. Yes. no. It's hot. It's hot. Yeah. Um, so he, he successfully builds a nuclear powered Game Boy. It charges, it basically has a, a nuclear source, a very, very low level nuclear source with a solar cell pointed at it. And it takes him like three months to charge up so that he can get <laughs> four minutes of gameplay and Tetris or something. And, That's funny. Um, just a, just a fun demonstration of a bunch of interesting concepts. I think that's cool. Very yeah. nice. Where did Dixon go? Because I think he was talking about Edmund Fisher, who is a cell biologist who died earlier uh -huh. this month. Oh, okay. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. Dixon, I we? don't know where he went. Um, he actually, his connection was great at, in the end yeah. uh, after he solved his technical issues, but now he's gone. Too bad. Now he's gone. Okay, that brings it to me. My pick, actually, this is also given to me by Amy. So the two papers in my pick is all Amy's. <laughs> this is episode. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. This episode sponsored by Amy. Uh, this, uh, which, uh, which episode is that? <laughs> it's 809. This is uh, an article from The Atlantic by Craig Spencer, <laughs> who is an emergency room physician here at Columbia. And some of you may remember, he, he went to West Africa in 2015 to take care of Ebola patients and came back. Um I think he had he developed Ebola over there and recovered, and then he came back and many months later had a recrudescence, if I'm not mistaken. We talked about his case a long time ago. 
Anyway, he's written this article in The Atlantic. No, vaccinated people are not just as likely to spread the coronavirus as unvaccinated people. This has become a common refrain among the cautious, and it's wrong. And I really like that a physician is getting it right <laughs> about this, yeah. right? Because a lot of them just look at the headlines and, and don't. And so he, it's a very clean, clear, simply written article. He says, the misunderstanding is born out of confusing statements from public health authorities and misleading media headlines is a shame, resulting in unnecessary fear among vaccinated people, all the while undermining the public's understanding of the importance and effectiveness of getting vaccinated. So it goes through what's going on. And I really think it's, it's quite nice. So thank you, Craig. He apparently is also running... Um, Global Health at Columbia, here yeah. at Columbia. So maybe we should get him on sometime to talk about his yeah. Ebola experience and what what he does for global health. Was this the recrudescence that involved an eye? I think so. Let's see. Because didn't we meet him at the ASM meeting where we uh, interviewed um, Kate Rubens? Or maybe it wasn't the Kate one. It was another So one. there was another uh, physician who... Okay. Did yeah, the same, and that's who we met. Name. That's who we met okay. uh, at the meeting. Yes, and he said he'd right. be happy to come on to it. Yes, yeah. uh, the last Emo American Ebola patient treated in the U.S. Yes, um, so they both had. It's interesting. They're both. I think they're both uh, ER physicians. Who's the guy's name? The other guy. Do you remember, uh, Rich? I remember? forget. Josh Stillman. Josh Stillman? <laughs> no, he was an, he is an oh, ER he's, physician. He's, a, he's an ER Columbia. guy here, and he was on yeah, that's right, that's TWIP, right. I think, with us. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, okay. he did tapeworms. That's anyway, correct. this is a nice uh, article. Check it out. And we have two listener picks. Michael writes, longtime listener. I came to TWIV looking for factual and truthful info when the Ebola outbreaks happened in Africa several years back. Love listening to you. Thanks for all the wonderful discussions and banter. Thanks especially for all of the COVID-19 info over the past almost two years. Oh my gosh, it's almost two years. Yeah. Just thought I'd send a link through that you might want to share with TWIV mm -hmm. listeners. A fairly lengthy and detailed article on the history of mRNA vaccine development. It's a nature article. A lot of folks seem to think inaccurately that mRNA tech was whipped up in the last 18 months <laughs> to solve the COVID problem. And thus is risky due to being new. This article may help shed light on the truth and background. Thanks once oh, again. Just try it. Sorry, go, go it just ahead. turns out it turns out that just today, yep, the two the woman the woman and Weissman were awarded the Alaska Awards. Oh, very good. Um, what is what is her name now? I keep forgetting it. Um, we need to mention mm -hmm. this. They're both at UPenn, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, they have Doug Melton here in this article. Wow. Yeah, but it's not. So yeah. ways, how to synthesize mRNA in the laboratory. They have a picture of a lab book. They must have their names down here at the bottom. Mm -hmm. The ones who modified the RNA, learned how to modify the RNA. All right, here she is, Catalin Carrico yes, and Drew just, Weissman. Yeah, right? they were just given the Oscar Awards today. Interesting, they don't have anything about in vitro transcription. It, that should be part of this article, don't you think? Yeah. Anyway, thank you, um, Michael, who's in Adelaide, Australia. And Fernando writes, weather, Palo Alto, 83F, light breeze from north-northwest, AQI, 1117. No thanks to the widespread Northern California fire smoke. Earlier today, I went hiking on the hills above the smoke. Silicon Valley was a pool of dirty haze while I listened to TWIV 801. It showed the team at its best, ranging widely without over speculation. All of the papers discussed were interesting, but I was taken especially by discussion about ancient viral genomes in Mexico. I resonated with Vincent's complaint about guns, germs, and steel, so I'd like to recommend a more scholarly, less facile alternative, Charles Mann's 1493, which also discussed monetary disruption from New World gold and silver, incidentally. The companion 1491 is highly informative as well. On exploration, Transoceanic commerce and what preceded the Portuguese, Spanish, English, Dutch colonial exploration and exploitation of the Americas, 
I recommend Felipe Fernandez Armesto's Pathfinders, which answers several other questions posed by the TWIV team in this excellent episode. Please consider those books as my listeners pick for a future episode. Well, you got it right now, Fernando. Thank you so much for the best journal club I've ever learned from. That's very cool. So, Dixon, while you were gone, yes, Amy wanted to tell you who had died. Oh, so, yes. And then Fisher died, the cell biologist. Ah, 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 okay. He's the one who died earlier this month and like looked okay. at cell death. He won the okay. Nobel Prize. Okay. I sit corrected. <laughs> Very good. All right. The rumors that's, of my uh, death are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> Twiv eight oh nine microbe.tv slash twiv for the show notes. Send your questions, comments, pics. We love them all. My, well, most of them, not all of them. <laughs> twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Palmiers at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Uh, glad I could join the group no matter how late. Yes, it's a very good. Your, your image and sound is excellent. Yeah, well, it's spot on. That's <laughs> thanks to you. Thanks to you. Well, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. <laughs> no, you gave me all the equipment. Come on. Well, but I didn't fix your <laughs> today's problem. That's for sure. You no, fixed no, that yourself. someone hacked into my account and uh, robbed my uh, password Sorry. for Google, oh. so I had to change it. Well, it wasn't me. No, no, it wasn't you. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Fair enough. Ian Crozier. Huh. Ah, yes, right. Yeah. He's the other physician who developed the eye right. business, right? <laughs> after we That's right. And we met him in an ASM meeting. Anyway, always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. He is Alan Dove on Twitter. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Amy Rosenfeld here at Columbia University. You can find her at enterovirus.net. She's all over the internet. She's on Twitter. She's on Instagram. And uh, go check her out. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. That's fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.